All right, so <coughs> is it on? Did you mail it? I, I emailed you. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's fine. If, yeah, yeah. For those of you who e e uh, emailed me, um, uh, you know, I, I, uh, as a matter of practice, I'm not going to acknowledge every email of this kind. I mean, if you ask me a question, I, I obviously answer it, but if you're just sending me something, I'm not going to reply back and say I got it, you know, just assume that I did, okay? Uh, all right, so, uh, and for those, if you haven't either emailed me or uh, given me a uh, print copy right now, then you'll need to come and uh, speak to me, okay? So uh, what I want to do today, uh, as I had mentioned to you uh, on Tuesday, is I want to spend the class on uh, Mother India, on the film. Uh, but before we do that, uh, we need to try to locate the film, uh, try to understand what are some of the historical developments, what is the political milieu, the cultural milieu of that time. And uh, the first thing to begin with, uh, recall, of course, that the person who is the Prime Minister of India at this time is Jawaharlal Nehru. And I had mentioned to you uh, about two weeks ago that Nehru uh, was a person who uh, was also a proponent of secularism. So, and there is a dispute about this uh, among scholars and historians down to the present day uh, to what extent India really was a secular country. And I suggested to you also that in India we have a different variant of secularism, that it's not what purports to be the version of secularism here. Uh, I say purports because I'm not convinced that the United States is a genuinely secular society, uh, but, but regardless of that, uh, judgment or observation, and you know that the model that's followed here in principle is a model of uh, church and uh, state, the distinction, the division between church and state. Uh, and, and so therefore you have such things as what is called the establishment clause uh, of the constitution of the United States, uh, namely um, the, the clause which says that the, uh, that the state shall do nothing to promote uh, you know, uh, religion. It shall promote freedom of religious expression, uh, but shall do, shall do nothing by way of trying to establish one religion or another. Right? So uh, that's the context in which we have visited the figure of Nehru, but I think now we need to have a slightly more expansive view of him and the period that he stood for. And the first thing to really keep in mind is that what India decided to do uh, in the aftermath of independence, of course there were some questions about that that arose even before India attained independence because uh, in 1917, as all of you know, there was this earth shattering event called the Bolshevik Revolution. Uh, and uh, this, the Bolshevik Revolution had repercussions which spread throughout the world uh, in fact, uh, last year in November, I had gone to Singapore for a little conference called the Asian Arc of the Russian Revolution, uh, where uh, the, I spoke on what were its implications and repercussions um, in India. Now, uh, uh, throughout the 20s, 30s, and 40s, uh, Indian uh, figures of prominence, such as Nehru, uh, I think the big exception there would be Mohandas Gandhi. Gandhi was not seduced by what was happening in the Soviet Union. But most Indian nationalists, and even when they were not nationalists, even when they were critics of the nationalist movement, uh, and critics of the colonial state at the same time, the Indian left, for example, uh, during that time, uh, many of them were closely following the events in the Soviet Union, what was happening in the Soviet Union. And for those of you who have some awareness of that, without getting into all the details, of course, uh, what they decided to do in the Soviet Union uh, in the aftermath of the revolution uh, was uh, there are two or three things that are of interest to us, uh, again, touching upon them very briefly. But one of them had to do, obviously, with introducing a model of a planned economy, okay? uh, or what, uh, what free market economists call a command economy. Right? a controlled economy, which would be managed by the state. 
uh, and in the Soviet Union what they introduced, and there's a shift there to what is later called NEP, New Economic Policy, so there's a rift within the left circles in the Soviet Union about what course the country was to follow, uh, and that in part would become the rift between Lenin and Trotsky. Uh, but as I said, without getting into it, because we're, this is not a course really on that, uh, the important thing is that there were discussions in the Soviet Union about the nature of a control or command economy. Uh, and of course, India was not in a position uh, to do anything of that kind at that point because India was under colonial rule. But I'm saying that, that people were already starting to deliberate and think about it. And then after independence, uh, what happened throughout the world was that all the countries in uh, country in, in uh, places such as Africa and Asia more or less had to gravitate towards one camp or the other. The two camps were obviously the Soviet Union and its allies and the other camp was the United States uh, or what in Europe would become the, the Warsaw Pact countries, uh, the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe and, and of course the NATO bloc which still exists as you know. NATO is still, still there. Right? Um, uh, India chose uh, this is not strictly germane to the film, but we're just spelling out the context here, the wider context. Uh, India chose uh, the path of what it called non-alignment, or what became the third path. Okay? Now, what is more germane, however, is that India decided under Nehru that it was going to follow the Soviet model in many respects. And to follow the Soviet model meant that you would have a command economy, a controlled economy that all major public utilities, for example, would be run by the state. Uh, and in the f late beginning of the late 40s, early 50s, mid 50s, through the early 60s, you can say that those 15 years from the late 40s, um, it really begins though actually in 50, 51. So there is what is called the five-year plans. And again, the five-year plan was a Soviet model. They had these five-year plans at the Soviet Union. So the first five-year plan was 1951-56, second one was 56-61, and then they had subsequent, I'm just giving, not giving you the whole history of that. Uh, and uh, in order to implement these five-year plans, they had a body called the Planning Commission. Right? Uh, and the chairman of that Planning Commission was a very powerful figure. Uh, the, the, uh, this particular body would then, and the five-year plans would set targets. Right? This is how these plans work. When I say targets, I mean very simply, just to give you an illustration, that let's say you hypothetically say that the target that we want to achieve in India is we want to achieve uh, a thousand million tons of sugar production a year. That's a target. Right? And so in order to facilitate that target, you had to ensure that you set up industries uh, in various places, uh, and they created these large state-run organizations, uh, very often really known by their acronyms. i just give you an example of what I mean here. So for example, BAIL, uh, which is Bharat uh, Heavy Electronics Limited, you know, okay, or HAL, Hindustan Aeronautics Limited. This is for setting up, for building aircrafts, for example. Uh, all right? And they set up steel plants. Uh, and it is during that time, by the way, that they set up in the 50s, beginning in the 50s and moving into the 60s, that they set up what would become uh, the big uh, institutions from where the so-called brain drain took place, particularly to the United States, the setting up of what were called the IITs. Indian Institute of Technology, and they had several of them. Um, uh, and, and it's an interesting, by the way, this, it's an interesting thing. The, uh, it gives you a little insight into the fact that India didn't want to be too partial towards one country or the other. So the first five big IITs that were set up, each of them was set up in collaboration with a different country. One in collaboration with the Americans, one in collaboration with the British, the French, the Soviets, and so on. Right? That's, that's what these IITs were. Uh, in recent years, they have had a huge expansion. They've added about 10 more IITs, but, but for many years, for decades, these were the main institutes. Now you can begin to see what the relevance of all of that is to some of what you're seeing in the early part of Mother India. All right? Because we're going to see the opening clip in just a, in, uh, momentarily, 
uh, you know, heavy cranes uh, in the background, a uh, lot of hustle and bustle of industry, as it were. Okay, you know, machinery, gadgets. Right? So the idea was that you wanted to modernize India. This goes back to the, the remarks with which I concluded my lecture on Tuesday. Remember that's, that the nationalists conceded that yes, in the materialist domain, we have lagged far behind. That's one of the reasons we were colonized. Um, we didn't keep up with technology. The West outclassed us, out eclipsed us. Right? And now we are going to have to do some fundamental catching up. It is also important to mention, and again, there is a debate on that. So my view is a particular view, although in, in, on this particular score, I think that now I represent what would be called the more consensus view. I usually don't belong with the consensus view, but in this case I do. Namely, that I think that now the consensus view is, uh, to a substantial extent, to a substantial extent, that India was really de-industrialized under the British. That is that India is a country that really suffered considerably under colonialism. That there was, that Whatever indigenous capacities there might have been, they were really demolished under colonial rule. You know, some one once remarked that on the eve of Indian independence, they didn't really even have the ability to make matchsticks. Now, of course, that was an exaggeration, but but the fact of the matter is that India occupied a very minuscule portion of the world's economy. One and a half percent of the world's GDP at best was contributed by India, uh, although as late as 1800 it contributed 25 percent of the world's GDP, right? according to figures that, that now are considered to be fairly reliable in my view. Right? But whatever your view of the matter, the fact is, this, why is this important? Because Nehru took it upon himself, along with the planning commission and all the others who were now charged with shaping the destiny of this new nation. It's a new nation, but an old civilization. Don't forget that. It's a young nation state, but it's an old civilization. Right? And that formulation is important to keep in mind in order to understand some of the ethos of this film. Right? The whole set of practices that had continued for a very long period of time, the veneration of the mother, the association with the land. These are civilizational values. But as a nation state, it was young, it did not have the technology, and the view was of those who are now at the helm of power that India needs to modernize itself with a vengeance almost. So this is one reason why India embarked upon these five-year plans the idea was that we need, we need a controlled economy. Uh, we need to be, have the state uh, marshal the resources of this country which have either not been used or have been exploited for the benefit of the colonizer. Right? That was the overwhelming consensus at that time. All right. So this is what I mean when I speak about the five-year plans and the nation and modernization. Nehru, in fact, went on record to say, he went on record to say that these dams, for example, and that's what you're seeing in the beginning of the film. You're seeing the construction of a dam. That these dams would be the new temples of India. By which he meant to say, we have had enough of temples. We have thousands and millions. We don't need any more. But what we do need are new temples. The temples of industry. And the managers of industry. And this Bharat Heavy Electronics Limited, the Bilhai Steel Plant. These uh, Hindu aeronautics, these are going to be the new temples. Uh, and of course, then what does that imply when you have temples of this kind, then you worship at these temples. A temple is not simply for tourists, it's for worship. Don't forget that. Somehow that, that, the implication of that was not really ever discussed. That if you're going to really, and he uses the word temples, that these are the new temples of India. But typically you go to a temple to worship. So do we now become worshippers at the altar of technology? Is that what, what Nehru and the people who were at the helm of affairs really desired. 
Right? That's worthwhile thinking. But this is what I mean by nation and modernization. Uh, modernization and modernity are not the same, and it's important to understand the distinction between the two. All right? Modernization has to do with what you might describe as the more material and mechanistic aspects of becoming a modern nation state. That, okay? So mo to modernize the economy means, for example, to put it on a more efficient footing. Right? It means to introduce certain regimes of mechanization, certain forms of machinery, certain forms of accounting, which uh, are more uh, 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 appropriate given the complex social systems of our times. Right? So to modernize a country means that you move from the bullock cart. Uh, notice that, that in Mother India, the bullock cart is, is constantly prevalent. Right? And so to modernize means to have, for example, a whole network of roads, right? Where, which can be used to ferry people, goods, have a transportation system, a mass transportation system, that's modernized. But people can, be, can modernize and yet not be modern. And that's where the distinction between modernization and modernity is indeed actually exceedingly important. Because uh, I'll give you a trivial cliched example, but it's a useful one. Cliches can have their uses sometimes. This is a, going to be a good illustration. That it's often been seen, and, and sometimes people remark that, you know, the most prominent Indian scientists uh, at institutions such as IIT or the Indian Institute of Science uh, who worship at the altar of modern science, but they still go to astrologers. They go to astrologers all the time. Every time they want to get something done, some auspicious occasion, they're going to consult, you know, the stars so forth and so on. Or they might have very rigid views, which you would think of as pre-modern, about, for example, the role of women in a society. Right? They, they might get completely flustered if their young daughter comes to them and says, well, I'm <coughs> dating. You know, and God forbid if she's from a Hindu family and she's dating you know, a Muslim or a Dalit, or, you know, well, then, of course, all hell is going to break loose. I can't tell you how many Hindi films have been made on things of that kind. Right? But you see, that's what I meant. I'm using a trivial example, but just so that you understand. Because to, to be modernity is a, the conceptual framework of how we locate certain things. What happens to time and space under modernity? What happens to social relations under modernity? Right? So the projects... Now, Nehru was a complex man, and he was a sophisticated man. He was not modern in the mechanical sense of being modern. That is, that he understood that you are not going to make India modern simply by having a system of roads and railways and machinery and so forth and so on. That people would have to think, okay, in a different way, in a way which would conform more with what had happened under modernity in the West. You know? And that's where we begin to think about time and space differently. We think about social relations differently. Um, we think very, very differently about such things as blood ties, for example. Right? So Nehru was committed to, I think, the larger expansive concept. And one thing that has been argued is that there was a huge gap between what someone like him thought and how people actually took to the project of being modern because they embraced the modernization aspect which was relatively easier but did not embrace modernity as a whole. Right? Uh, and if I had to pick a slightly less trivial example, slightly less trivial example now, uh, actually considerably less trivial example of uh, what it would mean not to have really entered into the modern age. For example, there are reports from the state of Haryana. So Haryana is a state in um, northwest India, uh, on, uh, bordering Delhi. Um, and uh, there are reports from some villages in recent months, I'm talking about, 
in some in recent months where young women for example in those villages uh, they do what young people do here uh, and even not so young people do here all the time which is spend 20 hours a day on their phones you know chit chatting this and that texting you know this that it's just endless right and so some of these young women were apparently had you know virtual boyfriends if I may put it this way okay uh, you know the people they're texting with in some other village well the village elders the men found out they got furious they confiscated they said these women can't have cell phones at all now you don't obviously resolve issues this way right so so this is where so I say well you know look there, there's really no understanding of how things have changed in our times right uh, and this is of course the this is uh, a reassertion of the worst form of patriarchy, subjugation of women, control of women, etc., etc. Right? Right? So th that's what we are really talking about when we speak about some of these kinds of things. Right? So nation and modernization, I think you get a sense. And then the most evident illustration of these projects of modernization were state projects. Uh, and especially things that are visible, you know, things that are grand. This was also the case, by the way, in America. People might think this is all sounding very much like, oh, the Roman Empire days, you know. Uh, no. You should read what happened in the U.S. when the TVA, TVA is the Tennessee Valley Authority, okay, was set up, and when they st started work on the construction of these huge dams which defined the TVA and people would go when the, when these dams were built very very often they would go there and they would picnic I'm talking about the US I'm not talking about India in the 1930s these were things to be celebrated so this is what we're speaking about over here big projects of the state such as Bakra dam all right and what it signified about the nation, the nation, a nation on the move, as it were. Right? This is nationalism, by the way. This is, you know, something you can take pride in. That, that this is no longer now a stagnant nation. We are an independent nation. And of course, we haven't come to the second set of questions, which we are now going to come to before we turn to the, to the, the film itself. And that is that when you have a young nation state now committed to modernization and all of that, then we have to say, what cinema is appropriate for a nation of this kind? In order to answer that question and to prepare the way, they set up a film inquiry committee in 1949. And one of the mandates of this committee tacitly was to attempt to understand how do we produce a cinema or encourage a cinema and, and we have to, we have to, not every film that came out was state managed, but they did have a censorship board. The censorship board had been set up, of course, in colonial times, as they do have a censorship board here too. Uh, the censorship board here is the one that assigns the ranking to each film. You know, is it going to be PG or is it going to be R? Or is it going to be you, universal? So if it's an animated film, you know, with, you know, cute toys and all of that, uh, you know, or babies or baby animals or whatever, then obviously it gets a U rating. You know, if there's some degree of slight sex or in, insinuation about it, maybe PG, that sort of thing, right? They, 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 that's what they do. In India, the board then and now has a lot more power than it does here. Okay, because here, you know, once you move beyond a threshold, then you just say, just give it an A, you know. Uh, uh, but this, but in, back in India, the supposition was, well, in our culture, we don't do things of this kind, which is completely phony, frankly, if you ask me. But that's it was. That, you know, you, you want to pretend that, you know, these, that you're not going to have a film that's semi-pornographic because we don't make films like that, you know, right? So the question of giving... So if there was anything which looked even remotely, you know, s close to soft porn, immediately give it an A. That was understood in India. All right? Uh, that's what the censorship board existed to do. But 
the films were not being produced by the state. The state produced films, those were documentaries. And there was a, there was a, there was a division that was set up called the Films Division in India. The Films Division. And it produced a large number of documentaries and it also produced newsreels. And I remember when I first started, when I was going to cinema in the early 70s in Delhi to watch a, one of these mainstream films, uh, that before the film started, they would always have a newsreel. So the newsreel would be about five, ten minutes long, and it would give you a progress report on the nation, as it were. You know, which dam has now been built, you know, that sort of thing, right? Uh, and again, newsreels were not uncommon in the U.S., not uncommon, during, particularly during World War II period, if you read, I'm not old enough to have been born during that period, but I've read film histories, and, and when they used to screen films there uh, during the war period, and even after that, they would begin with a newsreel, you know, which would give you the latest report of what was happening on the Western Front, or what MacArthur was doing, so forth and so on. All right, that's, so now, you see, you need all of that in order to be able to fill in the real back, backdrop to this, but two more things here before we turn to the next slide short about Mother India. One is uh, the Soviet influence extended beyond the economic model. So it's not only the five-year plans. There was a whole tradition of Soviet realism in cinema. And this was very important for Indian filmmakers. You can see that in the works of Mehboob. Mehboob is a director of Mother India. And incidentally, by the way, they see in the background the logo, hammer and sickle. If you, okay, there's a hammer and sickle there. Uh, many of these filmmakers were deeply influenced by models of Soviet realism. And this model of Soviet realism, you know, tended to show the nitty gritty side of life in the new Soviet Union and how the people were raising themselves up. Uh, and again, they, they, to some extent, of course, it was also a facade because the other thing that was happening, which is not happening in this film, that's an important distinction, the other thing that was happening in the Soviet Union was the collectivization of agriculture. Th that the, the, they decided in the Soviet Union, they came to the conclusion that if the state is going to be the owner of all property effectively, or you're going to have communes, communally owned property, the one problem was that if you've got millions of peasants owning small plots of land, well, it's difficult to mechan introduce mechanized agriculture in an efficient way unless you have much larger plots of land. So that was the collectivization, forced collectivization, and effectively the Soviet state committed genocide in the pursuit of forced uh, uh, collectivization of agriculture. That did not happen in India. We have to be clear about that. Right? So, so the, the, India didn't follow the Soviet model in that respect. It did, it did undertake land reform. And the question of land reform is there in this film. In the background, throughout. Right? And, and in particular, there is this whole question of the money lender. And we're going to try to consider what that really means. But this is what I mean by that. And then finally, you have the Mother Earth Triad uh, Nation Triad in this film, which was uh, not really a Soviet kind of model, but in part it had, it had certainly been inspired by that. Certainly you found the Mother Earth uh, you know, diet there, and sometimes you would find the nation. Uh, but the, 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 I, but remember that the vision of India that you see here, let's say unlike Divar, Divar is mid 70s, right? And it's set in the city. It's set in the city. It moves to Bombay after the small town scenes initially. Then it moves to Mumbai, what then was called Bombay. Mother India, you might have noticed, does not move from the village. It does not move from the village. You. You have some notion of migration in a little bit, but it's internal migration from one village to another. There is no sense even of a town. There is no sense of the urban, if you, thought, if you think about it, frankly. 
in Mother India. This is, this is something to dwell on. Um, that is the idea of the village. Now, we need to say something more about that. Okay, so when we start to interpret Mother India, these are some of the considerations that I think we're going to have to keep in mind. I'll get back to this village thing. Um, of course, here now this is anachronistic because Mother India is made before Divar, so it's not like they're thinking of Divar. Of course not, but we are thinking of Divar because we started with Divar. And some of you might, if you thought about it, might have noticed that Mother India, even though it's set in the village, anticipates many of the structures of Divar. The two brothers who go down different roads, both competing for the mother's affection. And the mother is really more affectionate towards the rascal type. Uh, in Mother India, there's no question that of all the sons she has, she loses one very early on, then she loses another one during the flood. All right. Uh, then you have the two who grow up with her. Again, match cut, by the way. It's a match cut. In Divar, they're, they're young boys, and they're at the temple. The bell rings, and now they've suddenly grown up. That's called a match cut. You had the same match cut here. They're plowing the land with their mother, and now they're suddenly young, handsome bulls. Okay, right? That, that, that's a match cut. As, so, uh, but it sets the model for Divar, because as I said, you have two brothers going on down different roads, uh, and of course you have the absent father. The father disapp disappears in Divar, uh, he's, been, he's been tormented, exactly the same thing. The, he listens to all the taunts of the moneylender, what kind of man are you, where's your manliness, living, up on, living on your wife, you know, all of that, and then one night he just disappears. Notice, by the way, even the vermilion, even the vermilion, the, the Sindur theme, because, uh, you know, when he, when he leaves in Mother India, when he leaves uh, at night, um, and he doesn't have any hands, right? He's lost them in the accident. Uh, he has a shawl. So with the shawl, you think he's kind of like embracing her in a way. What he's doing is he's striking off the vermilion, as if to tell her, don't Consider yourself a married woman any longer. You know, you're no longer married to me. I've abandoned you. As if to say to her, I give you your freedom. If you want to now marry someone else, all of these things are possible readings. But it's very clear what he's done. He's removed the vermilion from her forehead, indicating that she's no longer a married woman, and therefore he has no rights of possession, as it were, no conjugal rights, nothing of that kind. So in all these respects, you can see how Mother India set the tone for a film such as Divar, but Divar is an urban film, and Mother India is a rural film. And then therefore you ask yourself, what happened in those two decades? Something happened in those two decades. And one of those things that happened was precisely this massive migration from the rural areas from villages, from the countryside to urban areas. That India was in 1947 and remained throughout the rest of the following decade a predominantly, overwhelmingly rural civilization. Remained an overwhelmingly rural civilization. Agriculture was a source of that economy. These, these industries were just coming up now that we're talking about. Very few places had access to electricity and water. This remained true throughout the 60s, 70s. Here again, if you'll forgive me for interjecting a personal anecdote, but simply because that, that drives home the point, that when I was growing up, electricity cuts of 10 hours a day were common, exceedingly common in the 70s. You know, all right? 10 hours a day. Uh, 12 hours a day, and, and, you know, and they didn't time them so that when you had your final exams the night before, okay, so you know, we're going to switch the electricity back. No, it's not like they're timed or that you're given advance notice. It, it can just go off any time. You know. And we always used to say 1971, there was a war between India and Pakistan. I remember that. So you know, when you have a war, and because these are neighboring countries, you have a blackout. <laughs> 
you know, that by, by state order, you had to make sure that all the lights were turned off and people would quip. They don't need to act, actually issue an edict because most of the time we don't have electricity anyhow. You know, right? what's the point of this edict from the state for a blackout? Right? That's the situation I'm describing. So what had happened in those two decades is this migration to urban areas and therefore now the basis of Indian civilization is changing. That is something in my view that no one has really fully written a book on yet. And these two films are good milestones for understanding that change. You know, roughly similar themes in many ways, certainly the structures of the film in many ways, and yet very different backdrop, right? At least, at least ostensibly, all right? So that's what I mean when I say that India was still a predominantly rural country. Uh, and now to go back to the village, which of course I've talked about, but, but this was an old idea. That the, the, the notion that uh, several ideas here, <coughs> which are intertwined with each other. One, that the village itself is an ideal unit. The village itself is an ideal unit. It's a small enough unit. Everyone knows everyone. One big advantage of the village, something that we should not sneer about at all, because I think we can learn from it. That is that it was a unit and still is a unit where you don't commute to work. You live and work in the same place. I mean, how much time we all spend commuting, right? I mean, modern civilization is a disaster in some respects. Because the idea of an integrated unit where the community, the family, the place where you work, it's all at the same place, right? is I think important. And so the village itself was an ideal unit. Social relations were ideal. Everyone knew everyone. Of course, the downside of that was, and you see that constantly now in this film, the downside was that those who flouted the regulations uh, could be ostracized. The village had the power to ostracize you. That was terrifying. You see, when you get, when you get, if, uh, in, in the, what the city gives you is what? This film is all about that. Think of it this way. It's, this is a film also about the city in absentia. The, villi- the city gives you anonymity. Anonymity. The classic, sh- Short that I think of, um, and if there is an opportunity, I'll show you that shot from this film called Satya, 1989 film. And the classic shot, a man is coming into Mumbai, into this huge metropolis. He's coming into the, the city, uh, and the camera is going to zoom down very slowly. And, and, you know, he's one in a crowd of tens of thousands and then slowly comes down and focuses in on him. Because how do you take the individual out of the masses? Right? And you don't know who he is. Where does he come from? What's his caste? What's his background? You know nothing. And you will know nothing. That's the, that's the anonymity that the city furnishes, which the village cannot. You cannot escape your history. This is what this film is partly about. You cannot escape your history at all. You cannot escape your identity. If tomorrow I started calling myself, and you know, I'm Vinay, and I start calling myself Michael Jackson tomorrow in the village, well, everyone knows I'm still Vinay Lal in the village. Somewhere else I may be able to pass myself off in some ways as someone else, but not in the village. All right? And, and there is the power of ostracism because, for example, the threat that he is going to be thrown out. Birju is going to be thrown out. And the money lender calls the panchayat. Panchayat is the gathering. Right? And so throw him out. You know, he's, he, he's a thief, he's a decoy, he's disrespecting me. So on and so on. That's the power of ostracism. But the film is, of course, not, you know, looking into it in great detail, because, because if I gave you the detail, uh, what's in, important in the village is that every person provides certain kinds of services. 
which are indispensable. So the village barber. So what happens if you don't have access to the services of the village barber? You might think to yourself, well, so what? I'll just cut my own hair or my wife will. No, it doesn't work that way. Not there. It doesn't. Because you need the barber there for all the great rituals. You know? That accompany life. Right? The washerman, the barber, the potter. These are all people who are providing certain services. So it was an integrated unit. Now there was also this notion, not just that the village is an ideal unit, now we move to the next step. India is a collection of villages. And there were indeed, by the way, at that time, about 600,000 villages in India. 600,000 villages in India. So that India is a collection of villages, and you can think of relations between a few villages, that's the most that you can really go to. You don't think beyond that. You think of the village and then you think of relations between certain villages. Right? And so there was this notion of the village community and Mohandas Gandhi took the view that in India you had to be attentive to the village and that the village was as an Indian ecological activist who I came to know, was the founder of the Chipko movement, Sundar Lal Bahugna once told me when I spent a few days with him, he said, Bharat ki atma gaon mein hai. India's soul is in its villages. That was the view of Gandhi. Now people who were people like Nehru and the modernizers, they all took him as, in this respect, they took him as belonging to a different age. And they dismissed that outlook. But of course Gandhi had many things in mind. Because one of the reasons why, of course, our cities in India have become completely unmanageable for anyone who's tried to live in one, all right? Completely unmanageable is because if you don't tend to your villages, then people will migrate to the cities. One way to think about arresting the problems is to actually make the village and the area around it a nexus for opportunities, for development, so that you prevent as it were, people fleeing wholesale into urban areas, which is essentially what happened beginning in the late 50s, mid 50s, moving through the 60s, 70s, and of course down to the present day, down to the present day, right? So in this film you see this whole representation of the village, and of course then you have to ask yourself, what does it tell us about India and so on. Now films, division, documentaries I've mentioned that that was the, that was the branch of government that was uh, and I mention it in this slide rather than the previous one because uh, some of the images are almost like they are out from one of these films, division, documentaries such as the opening sequence with the construction and then this woman with her weather-beaten, withered face. This is, of course, the actress, right? Nargis, right? Okay. Uh, the heroine of the movie, as it were, when she is asked to inaugurate. You know? In India, we make a big fanfare of inauguration, by the way. Everything is inaugurated. Uh, even when you put a light bulb in a uh, little park, they'll call the little councilman, you know, for a little inauguration, you know? Uh, Right? Uh, and, so, and here, this is a bigger inauguration because, you know, there's going to be a new dam and uh, irrigation canal that's going to be, uh, and the last shot is a very interesting shot because the whole film has been about blood, blood sacrifice. And then if you remember the last shot, it looks like a stream of blood uh, and then it, it becomes clear, right? Okay. Uh, so uh, th uh, that whole inauguration, the cranes, construction, this could have been out of a films division documentary or a newsreel. And most likely was. Bobby just took that and take, took that as the model. Okay? And th th basic struggles, because if you're going to get modernized, for, I mean, we're not talking about robotics here, right? We're not talking about sophisticated automated systems. We're talking about basic things like water and electricity. You know, those, those are the basics of having any kind of industrial development. And 
that's what we are talking about when we are talking about these five-year plans. Of course, there were other objectives, which I've mentioned to you, that you set a target of 100 million tons of steel production, 1,000 tons, million tons of sugar, so forth and so on. Some larger themes, and then we look at a few clips quickly. Some larger themes, battle between man and nature. Uh, in fact, it is this battle between man and nature uh, which is going to lead to the accident in some ways because they decide to till this portion of the land which is clearly um, not just barren but is full of rocks, is difficult to har till and harvest, make fertile. Right? So, so this, is, this is the narrative of how do we make the land fertile, how do we make the country fertile. Right? The whole ethos of work, productivity, this is the other aspect. This is more the modernity aspect, that we have to instill some values in our people, which perhaps we don't sufficiently have, or we have not had an opportunity to really exercise them under colonial rule. Now we're an independent country. So now we know that the work and labor that we put into it is for our own good, not for the good of someone else. Right? That's the change. But this theme is there, the battle between man and nature. Now, question for you, is there a class antagonism, for example, in this film? One of the, one of the uh, if you're thinking of the Soviet model, uh, you're thinking obviously of the fact that in the Soviet Union, much was made obviously of the whole fa uh, <coughs> idea of class warfare, right? Um, and in fact, some of the theorists of the revolution were very clear that that's what it was about, that this was a legitimate class warfare against the bourgeoisie, to use Marx's own term. Uh, right? uh, and so could you say, for example, that the figure of the money lender, he represents a certain class. Historically speaking, in colonial India, there was a clear rift, clear rift, between the workers and the peasants, on the one hand, the work, what you call roughly the working class, and the landlords, the colonial state, and the money lenders. That was, they were opposing them. The money, money lenders were, were much detested. And this film has some fantastic scenes. They, if you, I'm going to suggest how to interpret them, okay? Having to do with the money lender. But before we get to that, I'm simply suggesting you might want to think about this because, for example, the one piece you have, you have a couple of pieces on this film. The one is by Schultz, The Reinvention of Mother India, right? That, and, and she says, and I don't quite entirely really agree with that, that, yeah, you know, there is a kind of an incipient class antagonism, but the director has kind of ruined it because the director himself comes from a kind of a bourgeois background in a way, right? And how is it ruined it? Because basically it becomes a narrative about sexual harassment. Now, it is true that the money lender is this lecherous guy and he's got his eyes on her. You know, I, I mean, he, he d takes every opportunity he can to remind her, you know, particularly after her husband has, Radha's husband has deserted her, that you're all alone, you're helpless, look at me, you know, I can make your life uh, really cozy, I can put you know, endless number of gold necklaces around your neck, turn you into a real goddess. And I, I mean, you know, and every opportunity. I mean, there's some tragedy is going on, and this guy's just thinking of that. Right? So, yes, transparent, narrative of sexual harassment. And I don't want to say that sexual harassment is a modern term, and nobody was really thinking of sexual harassment back then. I think a viewer seeing it would have said, yeah, I mean, they, would have, they wouldn't have used that phrase. They would have said, yeah, this seems like a very familiar story of some lecherous old man, you know, lusting for a, a woman, you know, right? But no, I don't think it's only that. And it's not only that because we would have to understand very clearly this colonial background which persisted down to that day and still persists to some degree. It's become much more complicated now, of course. Um, but... And that was the nexus between the state, the landlords, and the money lender. Okay? 
And this is a form of class warfare here that we're really seeing. Birju understands that very well. You know, like who is this guy? We till we do all the work. He says, for 15 years, you know, I toiled with my brother. You know, this is when they're grown up. And then this guy comes and says, three fourths of whatever the harvest is, right? Because three parts out of four is what he gets. All right. So what is that? That has to be understood, I think, as an expression of class antagonism. All right. Although the Indian state was not a champion of that. The Indian state was not promoting class antagonism. You know, unlike the Soviet Union, which was overtly actually championing it, I would say, but, but not the Indian state. But it's, it's there in this film. Now, uh, the last thing, and then we'll see a few clips. The moneylender. You see, there are all these scenes there. There are all these scenes there which have to do with the fact that this moneylender gives a loan of 500 rupees to the family and then somehow a whole generation passes, 30 years passes and they still owe this man money. How did that happen? Right? So there's a whole sequence of films, we don't have time to see that, but there's this whole sequence of films where when Birju is grown and then he says to Sukhi Ram, he says to Sukhi Ram, the money lender, you show me the account books, show me the account books. And finally he shows him these account books, you know, this ledger, right? And, and, and of course he doesn't, he's illiterate. So he says to his mother, can you read it? And she says, I can't read it. And then he goes in from, from her to another villager, three more villagers, and each in turn says, I don't know what it says, because they're all illiterate. They can't read, right? Now let's parse this. There are several things happening here. One, of course, this is, you could say, a parable about literacy and the perils of not having literacy. Right? And you, of course, with my own, my own contrarian view of, with all of these things, I think, yes, there's definitely an argument to be made for literacy, but, but we can see that a country which has 98% literacy has put you know, a fool into the White House, if, to put it mildly, not to mention all the other things that are happening. So what good is a literacy if you don't really have a much more sophisticated conception of what does it mean to actually be learned, learn it, right? And to, and to engage in the task of learning. Literacy will not necessarily save us if you think that that's the motto of the film, right? This is the great liberal sort of shibboleth. Literacy and education resolves all the problems of life, right? If everybody was literate and educated, you know, everything would be hunky-dory, we'd all, no country would be at war with another. I mean, that's the biggest shibboleth and nonsense I can prob possibly think of. Because, for example, every study in India has shown, every single study over the last four decades, that the more educated you are, the more communal minded you are. The more likely you are to think, I'm a Hindu. This is my Hindu history, that person is a Muslim. Every study has shown that, clearly, unequivocally. When, when I'm saying that you see this idea that when we become educated, we become more liberal and we become more tolerant. That's what I'm referring to, right? We become more broad-minded. No. This is not a necessary outcome at all of education. And we have seen in every part of the world authoritarian regimes which are guided by the most highly educated people in the world. And this country itself, by the way, a lot of the people who are now veering towards authoritarian tendencies, beginning with Mr. Trump, who's a graduate of Wharton School of Business. Okay? And I can give you a whole list of names, a hundred names, and tell you where their PhDs are from. What I'm referring to is this idea. Of course, we can distinguish between basic literacy, right? That 
it would be hard to make an argument against it. Why would anybody want to do that? I wouldn't. But I'm just saying that we're going to have to really reflect on this because what is happening here, I'll get to you in just a moment, right? I, I know you had your hand up. I'll get to you in a moment. I just want to finish the train of thought here. See, he constantly refers to it as vidya, jnan. Ye kuch ajeeb prakar ka jnan hai. Some strange form of knowledge. He, for him, this is knowledge, for Birju. Knowledge is a form of mystification. Mystification. This money lender, he says, is using this knowledge against us to put us down in our place. And you see, he's puzzled because he has grown up, as we all have, tacitly with the idea that knowledge liberates, not oppresses. Knowledge liberates. But this knowledge, the question is not whether we want to call it knowledge or not, whether we should call it information or accounting, whatever, but yes, it's, it's knowledge for them. Yeah? This jnan, vidya, this is something that is being used by the money lender to oppress us. And so what is his act, what is his ultimate act of rebellion, if you ask me? He gathers all the account books at the end and burns them. Burns them. Burning of books, by the way, is a fantastic trope in history. Again, something that we write a whole book around that trope. The books have been burned for all kinds of reasons. The Nazis burnt a lot of books, incidentally in the 1930s, books that they consider to be degenerate. Degenerate. The, the lower castes in India every year, if we had a social evening one day, I would show you this whole video I took at Jawaharlal Nehru University three years ago. On the 26th of December, every year, in a few parts of India, the Dalits, the lower caste, they take one of the most sacred books called the Manu Smriti, the laws of Manu, which they see as a manual of Hindu upper caste oppression. And every year they burn it. Burn the book, physically, you know. There are all these tropes running through this film. This money lender's books have to be burnt. Okay? Because then, of course, it's not just he who was liberated and his brother, so that now the debt is resolved, the whole village is liberated. Because the same money lender has hoodwinked everyone else. Right? So, the, so this film is really looking at this kind of politics of knowledge here. And that's why this is not simply you say, oh well, yeah, it's just part of the plot, but, but we have to read, read it. Yes, you had a question at the, or comment at the back. Yeah. Thing. I was just thinking that maybe in a place like India, yeah. where the people who are the ones getting educated may be the people who are like the upper class or yeah. like say uh, people who may already have those communal dreams. Yes. But education itself doesn't really, it's just the same status of the wealth. Like the people who are educated are just the people who are able to afford or say like, you know, like the Brahmins or people yeah. higher class. So then maybe that but then No, you see you can do a long term study of that. You you're saying that look, the ones who are you know, they happen to be educated and then they get access to certain pieces and they become more communalized. That the question has to do with why is it that those who are educated, okay, also display far more communalist tendencies than those who are not. Communalism is not a rural problem in India. I have, I have to tell you that. It is not. It is a problem of our cities. And where it has become a problem in a few places in rural areas, you can actually, systematic studies have been done which have shown that they have sent people over from the urban areas to these areas to, quote, civilize them, make them into better Hindus or better Muslims, depending on the case. We want to teach you Hindus your own history. You don't know enough of your history. And it's almost comical, of course, because the people who are doing it they think that they know it, they're completely colonized. Their understanding of Indian history is completely colonial. But that's a long story. 
I, I, th- this is an, uh, not a subject that we can fully s- resolve right now. I'm happy to talk about it for it, you know. But I'm uh, make I made that remark apropos of an observation about this film, which has to do with the whole question of knowledge and literacy. And then, of course, I can extend it. So, for example, it is the fact that the money lender knows writing. None of these villagers know writing. They don't even know how to sign their name. How did this whole problem originate? She gives her thumbprint. It could be anyone's thumbprint for that matter, actually. Right? There is, it's only the thumbprint. They don't know writing. You see, there is a hierarchy between those who know writing and those who don't. And writing is, by the way, an important element in divar. In divar. The signature. Okay, the signature. If you've read my book, you know what I mean, because I have a whole chapter on the signature. That's the act of writing. So you see, and this is, by the way, this is something that I, again, my view, I have mentioned it to you before and mentioning it now that, you know, I always like to give you a much broader analytical sweep so that you can think about other things too, because it's not just what you learn about history, Indian history and Indian cinema, but larger things that this is, this was in fact, of course, the distinction between those who wrote and those who don't and the introduction of writing was itself a condition for the colonization of the Americas. A col- the condition for the colonization of the Americas had to do with in the introduction of certain kinds of writing systems from the West. And there's a substantial amount of literature on that kind of question. So that's even the broader. But there is always a kind of a mystique an aura at every level. It's, it's it, uh, the mystique and aura that is associated with a professor, let's say for a middle school student, is precisely that aura of something called learning or knowledge. Right? And here it's operating at the most rudimentary level, at the most rudimentary level, because they are at that rudimentary level since none of the villagers has access either to writing or to what you might describe as the world of knowledge. All right? Now, let us just take a little bit of time to just see a couple of clips. Um, and, uh, okay, um, I might have to just shut these. Might be the easier way to do that. Let's see if I get this screen here. Okay, one minute. Yep, all right. Okay, so we will now go to... That's a hammer and sickle, by the way. You notice that on the top? Yeah, if you missed it. Okay, actually you need to just quickly go to the... There. See, tractors. I mean, we missed a few seconds in the beginning. There's a dam. There's a dam, yeah. And kind of, uh, you know, sort of jolly music almost, right? You know, making it familiar and familial. (laughs) Think of it this way, you know? Yeah. Sweeping use of the cameras there, the cranes. A young nation on the move, modernizing itself. That's the narrative. This is a 50s, late 50s narrative. The new temples, that's it. All right? Doshad, by the way, lived in Los Angeles later on. The guy, music director for many years, you know. sequence. These are the, the Congress Gandhi caps and they're all wearing khadi, homes, 
uh, uh, spun, woven, ca caught. Can somebody shut off the lights so it'll get a better? By the way, the other structural similarity between this and Divar, flashback. The whole film is a flashback. In Divar, you have this scene in the beginning, same thing. The felicitation of the police officer, the garlanding, and then the mother, flashback. The whole film is a flashback, right? I mean, just incredible, the number of structural similarities between the two films. Because now you'll see the flashback coming soon. There we go, right? The whole film now is a flashback, and then when you get to the when you get to the old woman at the end, the mother India, as it were, it's going to be the very last scene of the film. Yeah, all right. Um, the uh, by the way, the the some of the scenes with the trees are quite interesting. Uh, I'll tell you a little small anecdote uh, here, uh, which will give you an interesting idea of how uh, how the colonial state thought of certain things and how so uh, for those of you are from South Asia you know what the do you know what the word banya you've heard the word banya right so what is it well, candidly what is it okay okay but can you make it a little more political would you or would you not agree if I said to you that the word banya is very often a pejorative word? Yeah. Yes? Yeah. Okay, it's a pejorative word. Like, you know, someone goes by, ah, it's a la banya. <laughs> you know? So, you know, meaning, ah, he's a fool or bugger, you know. He's a banya. He's one of these people who is small-minded, always thinking about money. Money. Okay? I think, so what is going, why am I mentioning this, okay? Well, you do have the money lender, who's a real banya, you might say. The word banya, you know how the British came up with it? The British came up with this word. Because that's not the word for the caste. They came up with this because you'll see a scene, a number of them, where this huge tree, which is very particular to India, it's a gorgeous tree called the banyan tree. The bunyan tree. Every village of this kind had a bunyan tree. Now the bunyan tree is a very large tree. And as nature is so generous always, it does not differentiate between saints and criminals either. So everybody would gather under the bunyan tree for shade. A lot of the traders, these village traders... And remember I said you could have the village and then you could have the neighboring villages. That would be the extent. They would come with their wares and they would sit under the tree. And that's where they would trade. The British knew this was called the Bunyan tree. They started calling these people Banyas. And it's a fantastic story of how words come into a language. Absolutely fabulous. There is a book, by the way, which I'm going to recommend called Hobson Jobson. Okay, this is not mumbo jumbo that I'm talking about. It sounds like mumbo jumbo, but the book is actually called Hobson Jobson. Okay, and Hobson Jobson hyphenated. Hobson Jobson is a dictionary of these Anglo Indianisms and colloquialisms. Uh, uh, you know, these words like banya, it gives you the whole history how it got to be used. And there are a lot of words that have entered into the English language, which are Indian words, by the way. Pajamas is a good illustration. You know, uh, pajamas is an Indian word. Veranda, it's an Indian word. Uh, it now entered into the English language. And, uh, you know, this book kind of goes into that. So, uh, uh, I mentioned this because, you know, I'm seeing this, this uh, banyan trees uh, in the film every now and then. I'm thinking to myself, how is it really working within the film? All right? Uh, uh, because... Part of the film is really about what you might call the generosity of nature, okay? The generosity of nature. Now, let's just quickly take a look at one or two other scenes and then we're done. I might see a couple of other clips later on. I want to see the whole uh, sequence at the um, end. Um,
There's an interesting argument against guns, by the way, uh, for those of you who did finish the film, because um, Radha says, you know, what's accomplished with a gun? Nothing. Nothing is accomplished with a gun. Uh, it's almost like a plea for nonviolence there, right? Uh, and the reason why we're doing a whole segment here, because remember, let's not forget that this segment has to do with obviously the woman as the embodiment, okay? Uh, of the idea of Mother India. Now, one of the reasons why Radha is so, uh, let me use a collo colloquialism here, worked up about Birju at the end is because she has told him in no uncertain terms that there is one thing I cannot tolerate, one thing I cannot tolerate, and I cannot tolerate if you insult the women of this village. This is not acceptable. If he fights with the money lender, yeah, you know, she's trying to contain him because she understands right from the beginning that their destiny is tied up with his. What's going to happen to her children if, if the money lender, and, and that's what the film is about, that she's rebuke, constantly rebuking his authority, you know, refusing his sexual advances, and then she has to suffer, obviously. Right? But one, so, so she can tolerate him picking a fight, which he picks from the time that he's three years old, <laughs> you know, with Sukhir Ram, right? Um, but she cannot tolerate that he should insult the women of the village. She's steadfast about that, and that is what, of course, leads her to murder, or kill her own son. This is, by the, way, by the way, where you don't need to worry about realism because then, of course, the first thing I, you might think to yourself, if you were going to the realist model, how come she wasn't booked for murder, uh, you know, after she killed her son? I mean, what you see here is venerated and celebrated, but maybe she ought to be in jail. Somebody might say no, but of course, because that film is not working on that kind of model of realism. And the Im important thing here is that what does the young woman whom he wants to abduct as a form of vengeance, as a form of lesson, right, for his opponents, right, that she represents the integrity and honor of the village and therefore of the nation. This is why I've spent so much time on the village because the village is the nation in microcosm. It is the nation in microcosm. Just as a nation has different components where you have different people fulfilling different services, right? And you do have, by the way, a kind of a rudimentary school teacher there as well, all right? Uh, there's this comical scene where he goes and sits, you know, and starts doing his vowels. Ah, remember that scene, you know? Um, so there's a little comic relief there that you find. But the, the reason why you have all of this is because the village is in fact actually the microcosm of the nation. And therefore, the assault on Rupa is the assault on all girls of the village, all young women of the village. It's an assault on the integrity of the woman as the icon of the nation and it's an assault on the nation itself. So therefore, when she's actually, she's not simply defending, by the way, and if you take, go along with that reading, she's not simply defending the honor of the, the village and the honor of this young woman. She's defending the honor of the nation. She's saying those are the values that have to be upheld as a nation. So implicitly, the filmmaker is saying those are the values that have to be upheld if we are going to make progress. The only, if you think that the only trajectory of progress is dams and roads and getting electricity and getting water, then you're mistaken. Because there is another trajectory and the film is raising this point, fantastic point, with which I'm going to leave you. We'll get to a couple more clips on Tuesday, just very briefly. What is that point that it's raising? That and this is, I think, a problem for every country, not just India. And that problem is that we have moved along 
with respect to technological progress at an extraordinary rate. I mean, even in the last 30 years, the, the differences in technological systems between now and 30 years ago is astronomical. 30 years ago, think of it, there was no internet. I mean, today, life seems inconceivable without the internet, right? The pace at which information moves, astronomical change. So what's the problem? The problem is, have our forms of thinking moved along at the same astronomical rate? If they've moved along at all. Right? Because if you think of it, could, could we say that the particular problem that we have to wrestle with at this juncture, whether it's India or the US or anywhere else, is the fact that we have made a lot of technological progress. Have we made any moral progress commensurate or with that technological progress? Or is that completely outstripped the way that we conduct ourselves in our ethical lives and in our social relations with others? And that is one reason why to just mention one social movement, which is all over us now, in front of our face all the time, I'm talking about the Me Too movement, it's partly about that. They're not articulating it, it, it at that level. They're articulating it as a narrative of sexual harassment, you know, that women haven't really quite in, broken the glass ceiling yet. You know, if you can extend it, you know, there, there should be equal pay for equal work, etc., etc. But then if you extrapolate from that, if you were a moral philosopher, you would have to do something else with it. You would have to go to the next level and you'd say, that's the, the nature of the problem is not simply that. This is a symptom, actually, of the larger problem. A larger problem is that we have become different human beings with respect to our relationship to technology. But that change has not been accompanied by any fundamental improvement in our social relations or in our understanding of the moral universe. I think that this film, in fact, actually is partly about that. That's why those scenes are interjected of progress. But then what's the real progress in social relations and all of that? Okay, we end there.